Welcome to the Middle Earth Philosopher, where I talk about ideas, concepts, and relationships with people in Middle Earth and try to examine them from a philosophical point of view that may have existed in the world at that time. If someone asked you who were the most well-known characters in the Cimmerillion, particularly among the Elves, you probably would think of people like Feanor, or his brother Fingolfin, or Morgoth, and so on. However, I highly doubt that the character named Fenarfin would come to mind, even though he is the brother of Feanor and Fingolfin. And there is a reason to that, because he's only mentioned towards the beginning of the First Age and at the end of the First Age during the War of Wrath. And I think, like his appearances in the book, that his philosophies towards life are subtle but also very apparent and have important consequences as well. Fenarfin's story starts out just like Feanor's and Fingolfin's, so there's not really much difference or much to tell there. He is part of the family feud between Fenway's first son for his first wife and his second and third son with his second wife, Endis and that this culminates in the exile of Feanor when he confronts his brother Fingolfin, the killing of their father Fenway, and the Noldor choosing exile over staying in Valinor to retrieve the Cimmerals and to get revenge on Morgoth. Where Fenarfin's story gets interesting is in the finer details, and I think you can pull from his interactions with other people as well as his lineage, what his philosophies and his approaches, approaches were to people and the early events of the first stage when the Norda went into exile. So I'm going to start with the lineage. While Fenarfin's father was Fenway, who was obviously of the Noldor clan, his mother was a Vanyar, another clan of high elves that lived in Valinor. And the Vanyar were the almost polar opposites of the Noldor. They were lore masters and singers, and preferred to spend more time with the Valar and the Maiar rather than their own kind, even though at one point they were close with the Noldor. This preference is so extreme in some cases that sometimes it's mentioned that they barely, if ever, see their other clansmen, and also have no real desire to go back to Middle-earth unless they were commanded to or to help their lords to defeat Morgoth. Their priorities were essentially to enjoy the bliss of Valinor and to learn the wisdom of the Valar. While the Noldor were more industrious, more inventive, more creative, and more prone to want to learn new things, and were rarely satisfied with what they already knew. Likewise, this also made them more impetuous, more impulsive, and in many cases, more hot-tempered. So, to put it in an easier context, you could say that the Vanyar were the more religious of the High Elves of Valinor, while the Noldor were the more secular. And I think this plays a large part in why people of Fenarfin's clan were considered the noblest and wisest of the Elves. Also too, Fenarfin's wife was an Elf named Iarwen, who was of the Teleri, the other High Elf clan that lived in Valinor. Like the Vanyar, the Teleri were prone to keep to themselves as well, but they were somewhat more social than the Vanyar. Also too, they have had many interactions with the Noldor in their helping to build their city of Alcolande. And moreover, they were considered the best mariners in Middle-earth and Arda, given that they had an intense love of the sea. And I think you can see both of these natures play out in Fenarfin's actions and inactions during the feud that was happening in Valinor within the Noldor before the fall of the trees. This is because Fenarfin is barely mentioned when regarding any of the conflicts between Fingolfin and Feanor, if he's there at all. In fact, it seems he is the more even-tempered of the three brothers, and based off his lack of interaction in these conflicts, I would surmise it to say that Fenarfin was more conflict-opposed and tried to stay away from it as much as possible. While I can see him being closer to his brother Fingolfin because they were of the same mother and were closer, he probably had little to no relationship with Feanor, if any at all. In fact, the one time that Fenarfin is mentioned in a conflict within the three brothers is during the gathering in Tyrion after the murder of Fenway and Feanor proclaims himself as the new High King of the Noldor and gathers all of them together. While it seemed like Fingolfin and Feanor were again about to come to blows, Fenarfin is mentioned as being soft-spoken, but no less as powerful as Feanor, trying to calm down the wrath of his people and seek out more wisdom 
before acting rashly, and this is completely in line with the Vanyar's philosophy. And during the Battle of Alpolande, when he fights his in-laws, basically, he only does so because he comes up in the rear not knowing what is going on, just seeing that his Noldor clansmen were fighting with his Teleri clansmen, and thus he sided with the Noldor because he was supposed to be a Noldor prince after all, only afterwards finding out the tragic truth of what actually happened. So when the Curse of Mandos is proclaimed on the Noldor, Finarfin rejects Feanor as both his High King and his brother as well, and goes back to Valinor with a remnant of the Noldor who also repent and is made the High King of the Noldor that stay in Valinor. And that's an important point to mention, which I'll go into later. For right now though, the point is this. When it comes to Finarfin's philosophy and loyalties, it seems first to be towards the Valar, then the Vanyar, the Teleri, and then the Noldor, based on his interactions. He was always reluctant to follow after Feanor into Middle-earth to go to war with Morgoth, and as mentioned earlier, he is more conflict-averse than Fingolfin and Feanor as well. If anything, he is the least Noldor-like of the three brothers, which is something that Feanor actually hated about his stepfamily in the first place, and that the Valar were now pronouncing judgment on his people because of what happened at Okalande and what he did to his in-laws, and that the Valar now considered the Nodor outlaws was too much for Finarfin to bear, and was the final straw that broke the camel's back. To a reader of the Cimmerillion, this might make Finarfin seem more like a wuss. He pretty much disappears from the majority of the story up until the very end, because of his choosing to not follow after the quest to get their Cimmerils back and to go to war with Morgoth. That he was even willing to abandon his children to the quest and not go after them for their own sake, unlike his brother Fingolfin, says how much he valued the Valar's judgment and the crimes he had committed against his in-laws. And for this, he is noted as being the wisest and noblest of the three brothers. But I think there can be more to be discerned about what his philosophy was in regards to how his children interacted with the other Nodor back in Middle-earth. As mentioned, his children chose to continue on the quest despite their father's misgivings and rejection of Feanor, and they often went to visit High King Thingol of Doriath, who was the ruler of the Telerial Elves who had remained in Middle-earth, now named the Sindar. After the Nordor began to establish themselves in Beleriand and start trying to make allies with the Elves there, the loyalty of Finarfin's children comes into question when their cousin and son of Feanor Caranthir questions their loyalty because of their mother's kindred, and to be fair, and to be honest, his children seem to demonstrate more Noldor than their father in that they are ready to fight Caranthir because of the insult, and this is because they had in fact kept a secret, and it was only when Thingol found out himself what had happened in Alcalande that the truth actually comes out. Angrod repents of choosing not to tell Thingol of what happened and gives them all the bloody details of what happened and what led up to Alcalande. Now, Thingol's decision regarding this after he hears the full story is something for another time to go into. But for now, the point is this. It could be hinted at that there was some dissension and tension within Finarfin's own house regarding where their loyalties lie regarding their heritage. Whether that was to their grandfather's heritage, their mother's heritage, or their grandmother's heritage. And as I mentioned earlier, Feanor did not regard his stepfamily as being true Nodor for this very reason. This perceived philosophy may proceed to put a pale light on Finarfin, but as with anything, there's more nuance to it than that. Going back to an earlier point, Finarfin was made High King of the Nodor that remained in Valinor. And this is interesting because throughout most of the Cimmerillion, there's only mentioned one High King but it's referring to the High King of the Nodor that actually left, not those who remained. So what this effectively means is that the Nodor, for most of their history, had two High Kings at all times, up until the Third Age. It's also worth mentioning that while his Nodor aspects were not as apparent as in his brothers, Fornarfin still had them, and this is made apparent in two things. One being his words that were spoken in Tyrion, that he effectively almost sidelined Feanor's powerful speech 
when trying to convince the elves to leave Middle Earth. Narfin had urged them to wisdom and to slow down and take pace of their actions, and it nearly worked, because it said later on that Feanor was actually afraid of doubt seeping into the Nodor based off what had happened at Alcalande and what his brother's words were, I believe, since Alcalande would have made those words all the more powerful for those who already had doubt about the quest. So keep in mind that Feanor is considered the most powerful elf to have existed. He may have been arrogant or mad and had mother issues, however, his power and his talent were unrivaled and no one argued that. So for someone to actually challenge him on this and to nearly succeed at it is no small feat. And moreover, that this came from arguably the weakest quote unquote of the three brothers makes it even more significant. Essentially, Pranarfin has power, but he is reserved in how he uses it, and that plays a part in his philosophy overall in terms of being more conflict averse and seeking wisdom before action. However, he is also showing his Noldor side when he decides to break ties with Feanor, in that, like his brothers, when he makes a decision on something, he cannot be persuaded against it. When it comes to their choices, the three brothers had the same mindset and not even their own family can sway them from it. The other time when Fenarfin's Nodor side comes out is when he's one of the leaders that go back to Middle-earth during the War of Wrath. And this is important, because even though this was done at the behest of the Valar, it is still Fenarfin choosing to go and effectively follow after his brother that he had rejected millennia ago. And it's also too worth noting that he is the only High Elf Lord of Valinor who chooses to return. None of the Vanyar nobles choose or are mentioned going back to Middle-earth during his war. And as for the Teleri, even though they finally agreed to take the army over the sea back to Middle-earth, they choose not to step foot on it as they have completely renounced it in total. So that begs the question, what change in Fenarfin's philosophy that he now decided to go to war where before he would not? I think the only thing that is explicitly mentioned is that he does encounter his son Finrod after he is killed in Middle-earth and is resurrected back in Valinor. I feel that the two must have spoken about what was going on at that time, about the wars going on and how badly they were going. And I think that he may have felt guilty about allowing his children to go back to Middle-earth even though he had chosen against it because he thought it was unwise and was following after a madman. Thanks to the curse of Mandos, I think Fenarfin was well aware that the likelihood of him seeing his children again were pretty much zero, and the fact that he did encounter one of them again after he had been killed probably only aggravated his grief because of the death of his other children as well, even though Galadriel does survive. So essentially, I think the reason that Fenarfin chose to go back to Middle-earth, whereas the other kings and nobles did not, is for out of revenge. It was much more personal to him than just the behest of the Valar like it was with the other elves. And this does say something about how his philosophy has changed overall. That family eventually became equally as important as well as the wisdom of the West. And lastly, I feel it's worth mentioning the legacy of Fenarfin's philosophy and his approach to how he dealt with matters. As I mentioned before, he was the least Nodor-like of the three brothers on the surface. And because of that, he is not really recorded in the great deeds of the Nodor during the First Age, something that is part of the philosophy of the Cimmerillion, and that great deeds are committed with great sorrow, and that you cannot have one without the other. That being said though, it is very much worth noting that by the Third Age, along with Galadriel, he is the only remaining Nodor elf noble left alive. His brothers were killed, his nephews were killed, his sons were killed, and all of this must have bore a heavy toll upon Fenarfin, both as a Noldor king and as a father and an uncle. And in this sense, ironically, he kind of does parallel his own father, Fenway, when his first wife, Muriel, died so long ago. However, unlike his father, at least Fenarfin has someone to share that grief with and does not have to bear it alone. 